Okay. So yesterday I described these FZ relations as explicit list of all the relations we know how to prove on MG and sort of speculated these are all the relations on MG. And today I want to move back to stable curves and marked points. So, so I want to begin by sort of outlining what you want to do if you want to generalize these relations to MGN bar. So there are sort of two steps to this. And I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to fully write out the formula today, but I'll at least describe approximately what it looks like. But I, the first step, so generalizing FC relations to MGN bar, the first step is adding in the marked points. So I mentioned briefly before that tautological ring of MGN, like all the tautological rings for me, is defined by restriction from MGN bar. Since you're just dealing with smooth curves, this means that you don't have any you don't have any graphs to worry about. You just have kappa classes and psi classes. So this is a ring generated by psi one through psi n and the kappa classes that we had before. And it turns out that if you want to generalize the FZ relations by adding in those marked points, then you sort of do, do it in the one of the simplest ways that you could hope for. So you have to change what relations are now going to be parameterized by. Relations, let's say relations in RD of MGN are, or these relations, I should say, although again, these are all the relations we know of, are parameterized by, so be, previously we had a partition sigma with Um, no parts that are 2 mod 3. We still have that, but now we need more data dealing with the n marked points. Along with non negative integers, a1, a2 through an which are also not 2 mod 3. Note that they can be 0, though. And there should, again, be some inequalities, meaning the only finitely many relations. So previously, the inequalities that I had were written on the board were that the size of the partition sigma is less than or equal to 3d minus g minus 1 and congruent mod 2. I need to modify that by adding in the a sub i's, so I add in the a sub i's. So there are again only finitely many. For a given d, g, and n, there are a finite number of um, partitions along with a sub i's. And then what the relations themselves look like is going to be very close to the relations that I wrote down yesterday with n equals zero. For this, it will be convenient to do some notation, which maybe I should have introduced yesterday, which is that I define, so previously I had series A and B, these hypergeometric series in a single variable T. 
Now I want to define C sub 3i of t is going to be t to the i times a of t, c sub 3i plus 1 of t is p to the i b of t. And as usual with these definitions, number 0, 2, mod 3 don't exist to me. This is some sequence of power series. And the FC relations, as I described them yesterday, what did I do? I took the exponential of, I had 1 minus a, maybe I'll write it as c0 here, c0 is a. I inserted kappas, took the exponential, and then multiplied by b was kappas inserted raised some power b is c1, power raised to sigma 1, c3, sigma 3. You get the idea. This is the same. Um, this makes this formula look simpler if I have that extra notation. And then this is all just the same formula I wrote then before with the C notation. I add this upper twiddly thing, um, changing the kappa polynomial everywhere in there. And then I took coefficient of t to the d at the end. I want to do the same thing here, except I need to insert psi classes. Previously, I just had kappa classes, one polynomial in the kappa classes. Now I better have psi classes appearing in at least some of my relations as well. And I do so by just, at the end, multiplying by, I have CA1 of psi1 times t times for each point, CAN, psi n of t. And then I still take the degree d part. The, the variable capital T in this is just keeping track of the cohomological degree. So this should be right, equals zero, since this is a theorem, in Rd of Mgn. So Again, this is about as simple as you could hope for for inserting psi's in there. You keep the formula the same, you just multiply by some power series in psi before taking the coefficient, before taking the degree d part at the end. And they're parameterized not by partitions, but by partitions with some slight decorations, if you want, these additional integers. And the way you might guess this sort of formula is, for instance, when, when n equals 1, you're getting relations in mg1, you should be able to take the push forward by forgetting about the marked point. Forgetting about the marked point would turn the CA1 of psi1 t into some sort of expression involving kappas. It would turn it into something very close to one of these factors. So the condition that like, the push forward of a relation should be a relation is more or less how you'd come up with this formula. I mean, it isn't logically implied by the regular FC relations. Um, but serves the natural generalization. That's, that's the first step if you want to guess what the relation should look like on MGN bar. Since the point is that on MGN bar, even if you just want MG bar, you'd want marked points because MG bar is all these boundary strata where you glued points together. Okay, so that's just a... An easy, an easy to state modification of the formula with the psi classes. And to outline what the relations on MGN bar will then look like. So we have to remember what, what, what did tautological classes on MGN bar look like? They look like sums of these basic classes given by a graph and then a monomial or really polynomial in the kappas and psi classes being pushed forward. So, turns out that these, so now we're into step two, which is also going to be the final step, at least in terms of telling you approximately what the relations look like. So, step two, these relations on MGN 
Now we, before we were generalizing by adding in marked points. Now, now we're just extending by adding in boundary terms. So these relations on MGN extend to relations on MGN bar parameterized by the same data, which I've erased um, exactly what it was, but they're given by sigma and the a sub i with these conditions. The resulting relation, so if I write like r for relation of, then we have various input data, we have g, we have n, number of marked points, we have a cohomological degree, we have sigma, the partition, and we have a1 through an. That's the data we need to describe one of these relations over there. And the relation on MG and bar is given by the same data, and it should look like equals, well, it's the same, it's the relation on MGN plus classes supported on boundary. Where by that I mean that, that the graph that you, you use should be non-trivial for, for those terms. Should have at least one edge, correspond to having at least one node in your curve. And that, that's approximately what it should look like. Again, it's taking what you had before and extending it by adding something in the boundary. Then if you take this relation, you restrict the interior, you will get precisely that. Now, the actual formula for it is going to look something like, I'm not going to carefully write down all the details right now because we'll see another way of thinking about these formulas in a bit. But it will be a sum over gamma, a stable graph. And, okay, so now I want to write down some classes um, on this stratum here. It's really given by iota gamma lower star of some expression. Uh, maybe I'll draw the picture here. So I have some graph, stable graph. It has vertices connected in some way. Maybe we have a loop. We have, we have a couple of legs. One, two, three. Each of these should have a, a, a genus, which I'm not going to write down right now. This is what the graph looks like, and I need to tell you how to, where to put kappas in size. Yes. Sure. They're, they're vertices. I'm writing them as, as loops because I'm going to write stuff inside them. Possibly I should have made the circles even larger, but that would have made it even more confusing between them and loops. Um, so I, I need to tell you how to insert cap and psi classes here, decorate this graph with cap and psi classes. And the basic idea is you put an FC relation on each vertex. This isn't exactly right, so I, I can say a little bit about, but, but morally this is what's going on here. So by FC relation here, I mean really this MGN relation, because I have marked points. So each of these vertices has a genus, it has some um, half edges coming out of it, it corresponds to some MGINI bar, and I take some FZ relation parameterized by some amount of data in that location. That gives me some kappas and psi classes by this formula. I insert it in, in, in each of these vertices that I push forward via the graph. Right, so, so there are some details which I am going to gloss over a bit right now because we'll see them a bit later, but you also have to choose a way of dividing the partition sigma among the vertices of the graph. Sigma equals like disjoint union sigma v, v in the vertices of 
Gamma. And you also have to choose what all the A sub i's should be. So, so this tells you what the sigma should be at each vertex. Just summing over all the ways of assigning sigma to each vertex, I also need the A sub i's. And it's clear what A sub i's I should use on the legs of the graph. I still have the A2 that I started with, A3 that I started with, A1 here. But on the edges, there's something more complicated that has to be done. And in, there is some sense in which what's going on is I also have to choose numbers which should be x and minus 2 minus x along each edge here. It's not the way we'll see it stated later, but, but morally what's going on is I also have to choose for each edge, I choose x e and minus 2 minus e. Um, and then these are the other inputs I use for the a's. So also choosing these x e's. And what ends up happening is that, so you, I mean, this is something that you should have asked about when I first said I was putting an FC relation on each individual vertex. If I put an, FC, an actual FC relation on a vertex, forget about, about boundary issues. I should expect that that's already zero because it's a relation. The things I'm putting here are going to, in general, be FC relations, but in the in that they're given by this formula, but they are in the, remember I had this inequality relating G, D, sigma, and the A sub i's. They'll be in the range where that's, they might be in the range where it's not a relation. So you use the same formula to, to assign cap and psi classes to each vertex. Um, but but you, you aren't just putting actual relations on each, you're just using the same formula. Okay, so this is just the sketch of what the relations look like. Again, I'll, I'll tell you specifically what, what the relation MGN bar is later. The idea is the principal term is when your graph just has a single vertex, no edges, and then you just have the, these terms here. What did you say? Yeah, so you have to, um, and that's something else, where here we took the coefficient of t to the d um, for each term individually, and we also can think of it either as taking the coefficient, uh, taking the, the cohomological, the, the part of cohomological degree d at the very end, or we can also divide up the d's. D equals summation dv. There's also some technicality with regard to the parity condition that relates sigma d, et cetera, this mod two condition I had there. That, that also has to be applied for each vertex. So you really have number of vertex, number of vertices, different parity conditions. Again, you shouldn't interpret this as a natural formula. I mean, uh, uh, what, what I've said is almost complete description, but no, it, it is required for the individual vertices. Yes. Yeah, I mean the modified ones because I need the marked points. Yeah, no, no, no boundary. Like really what the sum will be is, I've written it as a graph here, but it will actually be of the form summation gamma graph, maybe this, this extra de data here, but then each term, the thing that I've written here will be iota gamma lower star of some polynomial in kappas and psi's. I, I don't want to put the boundary in again. The, 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 in a term with a corresponding to a given stable graph, I want basic classes which are in precisely that, that boundary straddle. Yeah, yeah, you, I mean, I'm multiplying the contribution from all of those. 
Yeah. I mean, the, the actual form of this will look like, this is a very common form for formulas in tautological ring will be summation over stable graphs should be like one over automorphism of the graph somewhere. And then here I have a product of various local factors. Local meaning given by the edge data, vertex data, or leg data in, in the graph, and what I have here, just product of all those factors. I mean, so, so what am I putting in here? Iota gamma is from some product M G V N V bar to M bar G N. So the things I put in there, they are attached to a specific vertex, but they involve like the psi classes, which are also along an edge. So like the, the edge contributions, if I wrote this out carefully, would be part on one vertex and part on another vertex. Okay, again, I don't want to get too much into, to, into the details here because we'll see a sort of more universal language for talking about this sort of formula. But this is the idea, and it shouldn't actually be that surprising to you that, that the formula should look like this because if you, if you believe that these are all the relations on MGN, which again, we don't know, um, if you believe that those are, are all the tautological relations on MGN, and if you take a relation on MGN bar, well, if you restrict it to the interior, the principal term, that should be one of those relations or a linear combination of them. That's this principal term. But you can also do tricks like restrict to a boundary divisor and then restrict to the interior of that boundary divisor. That should, if you start with a relation, give a relation on, in general, some products of MGM. And you would expect that you would get these FZ type relations again. So because of that, you should expect that not only the principal term, but also all the boundary alterations should be related to FZ relations in some way, if you believe those are really all the relations. Yeah, so, so the reason why this is contradicting each other is the details of what happens when you restrict to some boundary stratum. You aren't just like picking out what's in the center. You're, you're multiplying by some psi classes, more or less, because um, if you restrict to a given boundary stratum, then lots of different components from other boundary strata will contribute. You have like a sum of a bunch of contributions which should fit together to make a, uh, an actual FC relation in the end. One of those things is multiplying by some psi classes, and that's why you start with things which aren't in the range which would give relations, but then you multiply by psi classes, add some corrections from other boundary strata, and you end up with relations. Okay, so that, that's sort of, and maybe this is historical note about, about how, how one might guess this formula if you're stranded on an island and want to remember the FZ relations and want to know what the relations on MGN bar is you, you can work out what they are by thinking of, looking for something of this general form which actually restricts nicely to these relations on the interior of every boundary stratum. Yeah, this is what I was saying before about these aren't really FC relations. They're given by the same formula, but they aren't in this range. This is only zero if I need size of sigma plus summation a sub i is less than or equal to 3d minus g minus 1. That inequality isn't, isn't um, required to, to hold when you distribute sigma in the degrees here. All right, so as, as, as I said, I will give a sort of better language for writing down this formula. It would be quite, quite annoying to write down the formula at the moment with what we know, but I want to talk now about cohomological field theories and given Toll's R matrix action on them, which it turns out is really the natural way of thinking about these relations. So, 
always just shorten this to CoFT. And I want to talk about these partly because they're the natural way to discuss these relations, but also because um, they're sort of Cohomological field theories are really ubiquitous in families. When you, whenever you have tautological classes on MGN bar, they're, they're, it seems that, that a lot of those come from different cohomological field theories. So these definitions and techniques are really important if you want to think about classes on MGN bar. So what is a cohomological field theory? So it's, it's, I have to state a lot of, a lot of data usually call our cohomological field theory something like omega. And at its base, this is some family of homology classes, of cohomology classes. Um, so for every G and N, we should have some class. But I'm also going to, there's also additional data, which need the eta and sorry? Yeah, sorry, greater than zero. Yes. The same range I'm always talking about MGN bar. So what is this? This is really going to be a co FT with unit. The unit being the one at the end here. But so what are all of these things? So first V should be a you'll say a finite dimensional Q vector space. Eta should be a, a non-degenerate metric bilinear form on V, so a metric on your vector space. And I'll often use the notation eta inverse to talk about the bivector is an element of V tensor V. Eta itself is in V dual, tensor V dual, inverse should be in V tensor V. So if you want to think about coordinates, this is given by the inverse matrix of the matrix defining eta. That will show up later. Um, element one will just be a distinguished element of the vector space. This is sort of the numerical data, this vector space in bilinear form. Forms the base of the cohomological field theory. And then these elements omega g n should be an element in the cohomology of the n bar, rational coefficients. You could also define child field theories if you replace cohomology by child, but much less is known about those. So I'll talk about cohomological field theories here. I want to tensor now with take the dual of the vector space V and take n copies of that, one for each marked point. So we usually think of this as it's a Multilinear function which accepts n vectors in your vector space and outputs in cohomology class on MGN bar. Again, for, for any GNN, you have such an omega GN. Okay, so to be a cohomological field theory, to satisfy, I guess I'll group them as three axioms.
more or less the way you should think about this is that it's a family of cohomology classes on moduli spaces of stable curves. For every MGN, you have some cohomology classes which are coherent with respect to the maps between the MGN bar. So, First axiom is that omega gn is invariant under the action of symmetric group Sn acting simultaneously on both factors. So it can relabel the n marked points, and you're giving an automorphism of the cohomology of MGN bar. And it can also um, permute the n factors here in your tensor product of n copies of V dual. Would be invariant under that. If you're thinking of it as a um, multilinear function on product of n copies of V2, there then should be SN equivariant as a, as a function there. Second, we want it to behave nicely under pullback by gluing maps. So let's say if there are two types of gluing maps, maybe I'll just state this for case where it's simpler to say. So for, if you have the gluing map from mg n plus two bar to mg plus one n bar, given by gluing together two marked points, say the last two. Gluing map, then So I want to take the pull, pullback of some class on mg plus one n bar. What class am I going to take? I'll take omega g plus one n evaluated at some simple tensor, let's say. One tensor v2 dn. So this is some class in the cohomology here. I'm pulling it back to class there. And the result should be equal to omega g n plus 2. Now I, have to, I can give it the same inputs I gave before, but I need to give it two additional inputs. Additional inputs I give are precisely this um, bivector given by the inverse of the metric. So if you prefer, you can think about this um, as elements here, as you're taking on the right-hand side, you want to contract your um, tensor product of n plus two copies of V star by the spy vector to end up with only n copies of V star on the other side. And I'll just write, and similarly for the other gluing map. For the other gluing map, you have two, two different curves one, gluing together one point from each. So on the right hand side, you'll have the, um, you'll have the tensor product of, of two copies of two things which look like this and your eta inverse by vectors are distributed over both pairs. It's the natural thing to do, given this definition. So part two is saying that cohomological field theory should behave well under pullback by gluing maps. And behaving well is determined by this by vector contraction. 
Final condition you might be able to guess is about behaving well with respect to pullbacks by forgetful maps. So if pi from mg n plus one bar to mg n bar is forgetful map, then We want pi star of omega gn v1 through vn something. Now we need to come up with one additional input to give omega gn plus 1. Sorry, instead of commas, I should probably be consistent and use tensors. And, well, fortunately, we have this, this unit element. So there's one last thing, which it should possibly be separated out from three, but it's really um, spirit doing the same thing, which is that, remember, M02 is not, is not a thing we want to talk about. So we can't pull back from M02 to get M03. So we can think of this as a formula telling us how to evaluate an insertion of the unit. The unit acts as pullback. But what if we wanted over here to write omega zero three of V1 tensor, V2 tensor, the unit. So this isn't going to be pullback of omega zero two because we don't have omega zero two. Instead, this should just be the metric applied to paired together V1, V2. So. All right, so, so these are the three axioms of a cohomological field theory. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 in theory, you could, you could wonder, is there a formula like this for omega 1, 1 of the unit? Um, the way to think about that would be you can compute omega 1, 1 of the unit by using the other formula since you can get M11 by gluing together two points on M03. And M03 is really special because it's only zero di dimensional moduli space that we talk about. Eta should be non-degenerate. No, no, so um, no. Though we'll mainly be talking about. I may uh, get this in a sec second. So this is the basic definition, but there are a few basic. I'll, I'll give a list of some some examples of cohomological field theories in a second. Yeah, this is, this is all you, you, you want. Um, in, in practice, eight of one, one will be non-zero in all the cases that, no, I guess it will often be zero. No, eight, eight of one, one can be zero, certainly. Um, uh, this will become clearer once I use these definitions to define an algebra structure on V. So. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll get to examples of cohomological field theory in a minute. So the definition, quantum multiplication on V, is defined by, I'll just say, at the beginning, it's commutative, associative, um, multiplication operator by star on, I already said it was on V, 
determined by So if I take data of V1 star V2 with V3, so if I tell you what this is for every V1, V2, and V3, this will uniquely determine the multiplication because eta is non-degenerate. This is just going to be omega 0, 3 of V1 tensor V2 tensor V3 interpreting that as a rational number because omega zero three is just, exam zero three is just a point. It's a cohomology class on a point. Sorry? Yeah, it, it's D, sure. I mean, I was saying A as a, because the fact that it's commutative, in, well, the fact that it's commutative is obvious from the fact that, um, I mean, it, it, the fact that it's commutative is, is obvious from definition. The fact that, because we need to use the S3 symmetry over here. V2 and V1 without changing the value. Associativity is, is a nice little exercise to do, since you're actually going to need to use parts two, two and three here. More or less associativity here corresponds to looking at M04 and using the um, relation between the any two points on M04 are the same. Some of those properties, you can prove associativity that way. It's, it's definitely not obvious from this definition that's implied by what we had before. I should say that by three, rather the last part of three, um, one, this unit element is, in fact, um, the unit of V under this multiplication. Say this differently, as we, we, we choose one to be our unit element. This is a, turns V into a commutative al associative algebra with the unit, and it's actually more than that. V, v becomes a Frobenius algebra. Because you have some extra structure given by how you define the multiplication here. So V, v is the quantum algebra or Frobenius algebra of the cohomological field there, right? I mean, for Benius algebra, more so from this definition, you can see that um, eta of v1 tends uh, v1 product v2 with v3 equals eta of v1 product v3 with v2. For Benius algebra, is more or less just a commutative associative algebra with a metric on it satisfying this this identity with respect to multiplication. So it's a for Benius al algebra of the QFT omega. All right, so you have this algebra structure which justifies why I'm calling this thing one. Now some examples. First example is going to be quite simple. V is going to just be one dimensional. Eta is going to be one, um, of course, one to matrix one. The unit will actually be one. And I just have to tell you what the classes are. So V is one dimensional, omega GN should just be an element in the 
cohomology of MGN bar and define it to be the total churn class of the Hodge bundle. Hodge bundle I mentioned a couple days ago. It's just the um, vector bundle of one forms on your curve, sections of the dualizing shape in general. And so checking this is a cohomological field theory is just a matter of checking that the total churn class of the Hodge bundle behaves nicely under these pullbacks and basic properties of it. And note that you have to use the, the total churn class. If you use like just the top churn class, that, that, that won't work because this gluing map here that we have pulled back by changes the um, genus. So this is an example of how um, most cohomological field theories are going to be um, not of pure degree. They're of mixed, mixed cohomological degree, usually. Certainly don't have to be, but this is an example of why they have to be of mixed degree. You can't have something always be of degree G because then when you pull it back from genus G plus one genus G, the, the cohomological degree doesn't change, but the genus does change. This is, this is an example. That example should hopefully convince you that there are at least some simple examples of this. You can also modify this in a few ways to write down other, other, other like one-dimensional cohomological field theories in terms of the um, churn classes of the Hodge bundle. Now some more complicated examples. So, I mean, if you're in more than one dimension, the examples tend to be harder. There's the I'm not going to write out all the details in this one because I don't want to get caught up in defining the Verlinda bundle, but if you take the total churn character of the Verlinda bundle, or if you prefer to call it the bundle of conformal blocks, then this will be a cohomological field theory. And I should say, so in the first case, of course, you can guess what the quantum algebra is, the Frobenius algebra, it's just Q. There's nothing else that can be. In this case, though, I mean, I, I haven't told you to define for Linda bundle, you need various input data, like choosing a, choosing a Lie algebra, choosing a level. Um, the algebra, though, is going to be what's known as the Verlinda algebra. The fusion algebra. That's a much more complicated example. Yeah, so usually people are working with bundle of conformal blocks for Linda bundle. If you just look at the bundle itself and think about pullbacks and satisfies various like factorization roles, the, the bundle itself, that implies the same, that implies the cohomological field theory properties for the churn character of it. Turn character is basically a multiplicative function of the bundle. Third example I want to mention is actually technically not a cohomological field theory as I've defined it, but it's almost one. So, from a wooden theory. of the target space X, choose any X you want. Let's say, so this gives, I'll say what I mean by gives, it gives a cohomological field theory, I should put quotes around it because it's like a cohomological field theory with coefficients in so this notion of cohomological field theory is coefficients. It won't show up, but again, what I'm talking about, but it's a variant on this that you can do. Coefficients in the Novikov ring. Um, 
power series in beta, or really e to the beta, where beta are um, effective um, curve classes on X. So what's going on here is by coefficients, you basically have to tensor all the definitions by some Q algebra, in this case, the Novikov ring. And so you can think of it as your function omega gn, where you insert n factors, it will output not a rational number, but an element of this Novikov ring. And, sorry? Yeah, Novikov ring, I, I again, don't want to get too caught up in defining this, but it's, and maybe I should say e to the beta. Beta corresponds to effective curve classes. So you, this is basically taking the free monoid on the, um, uh, the I won't take the, I mean, it, it's a vector space with basis corresponding to the effective, um, as a vector space, it corresponds to the, um, basis corresponds to the effective curve classes on your target space. And, the way you define this is for each curve class, you have some space of stable maps to X with, um, with image in that curve class. And if you take the virtual classes for that, for all curve classes beta, and um, sum them together in a generating function, maybe cap by some cohomology classes, and then push forward to MGN bar, you end up getting a homological field theory in, in the sense with coefficients. And I should say here that B, the Frobenius algebra, ends up being the quantum cohomology ring of X. So the inputs that you give are cohomology classes, and then you have some product rule with coefficients in this Novikov ring. All right. So those are some examples to convince you that, that there are some geometrically interesting cohomological field theories. I will give at least one more example tomorrow. I also want to say one more construction. You can think of another way of constructing cohomological field theory. So given a cohomological field theory omega, say on the pair V eta one, that basic numerical data, Find, find lowercase omega gn of some input factors. Let that be the degree zero part of the capital omega gn. So again, in general, this is some impure um, cohomology class, might have contributions in every cohomological degree. Just take the degree zero part. Then you can check because degree zero things pull back to degree zero. Um, then little omega is also a cohomological field theory with the same other data, V eta one. Even has with the same, with the same algebra structure, the same Frobenius algebra. And so, this is now a cohomological field theory. It's only in degree zero, so it's not, not really about cohomology. So these are often called topological field theories. They're such degree zero 
So if these are called topological field theories, so any non-logical field theory has an underlying topological field theory. All right, so in a couple of minutes remaining, I just want to say two more things. First is important definition, which is, so we have this algebra here. You can ask, when is this algebra semi-simple? Or maybe, when is it semi-simple after some base change? And in that case, you, if it is semi-simple, you call the entire cohomological field theory semi-simple. Write that a co of t is semi-simple if it's continuous algebra is semi-simple, and then the reason why we care about semi-simplicity is theorem of Telemann um, more or less, and this is a statement of, of some of what he proved and proved more than this. Um, this is also known as Giventhal's reconstruction conjecture. And it's saying that right at right now is Giventhal's our matrix action um, acts freely and transitively on the set of OFTs with a given semi-simple Frobenius algebra. So I haven't defined given Tull's R matrix action. It's an action of sometimes known as, I guess, the symplectic loop group. Um, and some explicit matrix action, which once you write out definition, will look very similar to the sort of graph sum that I was writing earlier about the relations on MGN bar, how to get those from the FC relations. Our matrix action is doing some operation similar to that on cohomology of MGN bar. It's an action cohomological field there is. And Miriam of Telemann says that if you have two cohomological field theories with the same Frobenius algebra or equivalently the same degree zero part, turns out that's the same, then there's a unique R matrix taking one to the other. And the result of this is essentially is the classification of semi-simple cohomological field theories. I'll write that. What is this classification? I mean, you can be very explicit. Any cohomological, any semi-simple cohomological field theory can be written uniquely in the form R applied to a another into a, a, any any semi symbol cohomological field theory capital omega is given by applying some matrix action to its underlying topological field theory. It, it's equivalent here. It, it, yeah. yeah, so if you think about how I defined the quantum multiplication, I defined it just using omega zero three, which is only in, in, in degree zero. 
So that gives one well, that gives one direction of the equivalence. The other direction is that you can recover any th any degree zero information from the M03, and that's just a matter of taking um, basically de degenerating any MGN bar into lots of copies of M03 bar. Okay, that that will do it for today. The plan. Uh, Tomorrow, the last day, is that I'll, I'll outline how to use this, this theorem of Telemann, classifying semi-simple cohomological field theories, to actually get tautological relations and explain how the relations I outlined before, coming from the FC relations, sort of naturally pop out of this R matrix action if you choose the correct cohomological field theory and look at it in the correct way to get tautological relations. But I should say, this is a general tool, this theorem, that can be used to get explicit formulas um, for any semi-simple cohomological field theory, at least in theory. There's a question of how do you know what the R matrix is? And there's a sort of second part of Telemann's theorem that says under certain conditions, the R matrix is determined by some differential equations. It's actually, in a lot of cases, effective way of getting formulas for cohomological field theories. Again, provided they're semi-simple. <laughs>